The Lord be with you. This is a good thing to hear you all talking and visiting with each other. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. For those in the sanctuary this morning, those who might be watching on Facebook Live this morning or this afternoon or later this week, we're thankful that we can be together in worship and fellowship in this manner. Following worship today, two of the three teams will be meeting. Um, nurture team will not be meeting, uh, so stay tuned to see if maybe they will meet um, the following uh, Sunday. Um, but speaking of the following Sunday, we are going to have a blessing, back to school blessing. So for our students, for our teachers, for our other school personnel, uh, invite you all to be here. Invite friends uh, who again may fit in any of those categories. And we'll have a blessing of each of them. If you want to bring a backpack or a laptop or whatever, we'll bless within reason what you bring. So again, um, just letting you all know about that. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll be, uh, we will be at Parkview Mission. And so information is in your bulletin. We've been talking about that uh, for a while. And uh, if you can't be there, then certainly we appreciate your prayers. Uh, four o'clock at Park, four, four fifteen at Parkview. Very good. Absolutely. Um, we want to wish Alan Gerdahl a, a happy birthday this morning. He's probably home already celebrating, but uh, please give him our, our best wishes for his birthday. Um, we want to lift up Janice Martin, um, who is in the hospital at Lynchburg General. So please keep her in your prayers and Sonny as well. Are there other announcements that folks might want to lift up this morning? We have the makings of a good basketball team in the back corner there, so that, that's a good thing. I might find other ways to heckle you all later for sitting that far back, but that's okay. As we prepare for the light of Christ to be brought forward, let us prepare our hearts to worship the living God.
One other blessing I would like to share that Karen Bell's mother, Mrs. West, celebrated her 101st birthday yesterday. So that's a wonderful blessing. I invite you to stand and body your spirit for our call to worship. God speaks peace to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear God. Where God dwells, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. God gives what is good, and we respond with abundant praise. Let us pray together. Son of God, you walk on the waters of uncertainty to meet us amid your purpose journey for our lives. Help us to recognize your presence, remember your promise, rely on your strength, and receive your peace through every store. Amen. I invite you all to be seated and invite Cooper to come forward for our Old Testament lesson. Today's Old Testament reading is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am, am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. 
Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also you shall appoint Jehusun of Nimshi as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat of Abelmol, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill, and whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that I have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. And out on the waters, the storms raging high, the water around them was troubled that night. Fear filled their hearts, and they thought they would die. They failed to remember that the Master was nigh. He spoke the words, and the winds all stood still. And even the waters, they obeyed his will. He calmed their storms, just like he will mine. If I just remember that he lives deep inside. So why should I worry? Why should I fear? When the very same Jesus, he stays always near. He lives in my heart, and he hears when I cry. I call on his name till the storm passes by. We read in the Bible how he walked with them, brought light to their darkness when the way grew so dim. Great it would be to have his steps leading mine, to walk with the Master all of the time. So when trials come and death seems so nigh, I just search for the Master. He said he'll be there on time. When I'm in trouble and my body's in pain, all I have to do is call on his name. So why should I worry? Why should I fear? When the very same Jesus, he stays always near. He lives in my heart, and he hears when I cry. I call on his name till the storm passes by. So why should we worry? Why should we fear? When the very same Jesus, he stays always near. He lives in our hearts, 
and he hears when we cry. Just call on his name until the storm passes by. Just call on his name until the storm passes by. Invite Callan to come forward for the reading of the gospel. Cooper did a great job with the Old Testament reading, and I bet Callan was happy that he did the Old Testament reading with all those names. Cooper shaking his head, yeah, you did a great job. The gospel reading today is Matthew chapters 14, verses 23 to 23. Immediately, he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came, walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to the Lord, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you indeed are a rock and redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. How many people here this morning like to go fishing? We have some folks. Sarah likes to go fishing. I'm from the wilds of Arlington, Virginia, and so 
that I did not catch that particular uh, pastime. But there were three pastors who went fishing, and they were on um, on a you know nice nice little lake and small boat. It was late morning, and the sun started to beat down, and one of the pastors realized that he had forgotten his favorite fishing hat. Anybody have a favorite fishing hat? Probably. One or two folks may have a favorite fishing hat. So he gets out of the boat, walks on the water, gets to the shore, goes to the car, and gets his favorite fishing hat. So he, then he goes back on the water, walks to the boat, gets in. A short time later, there's a, a, another pastor, and she's like, I'm really thirsty. So she gets up out of the boat. She walks on the water. She gets to the car where there's a cooler, and she gets a drink. She gets back on the water. Gets back on the boat. So we have the third pastor. He's been watching this very carefully. And he's thinking to himself, those are two wonderful people of faith. They're great pastors. But I have just as much faith as they do. So what does he do? Gets up out of the boat. He starts to walk on the water and he sinks. Chris knows this joke. She's probably used it. You probably have heard it, but that's okay. So they fish him out of the, the boat, and he's, you know, really frustrated. He's like, I just have to have faith, just like they do. He gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water. This time, he's really struggling. They fish him out of, of the water, put him in the boat, and one pastor says to the other pastor, before he drowns, maybe we need to tell him where the rocks are in the water. Sometimes we don't see the whole picture. We think that we do, but, but we actually don't. Last week we talked about hunger, what it means to hunger for something. This week we're looking at what it means to look, to see. And our two uh, scripture lessons, we have wonderful characters from the Bible. I love the folks in the Bible because they're so real. They struggle. They make mistakes. They do dumb things. I don't know about you, but I do dumb things. Amen? Right. So, just preparing you all for when I start doing lots of dumb things. If I haven't already. The story of Elijah is a, is a wonderful one. It's, it's so rich. Elijah is called to, to speak to the Israelites who had, had turned away from Yahweh, turned away from God, and they were worshiping Baal and Asherah and these other gods and there had been a terrible drought upon the land. And God directed Elijah to have a contest. How many of y'all know what contest I'm going to tell you all about? Okay. Harper's back there. Rob knows. Some of y'all do too once I start talking about it. Elijah was going to have a contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. And the challenge was, which of their gods could rain down fire to light wood? And Elijah being the gentleman that he was, although that's questionable at times, but let's just give him that. He says, you, you go first. So for hours in the morning, they're chanting to Baal and Asherah and wherever, and nothing's happening. And one of the funniest, the Bible is funny, y'all. Can I get an amen? The Bible is funny. 
You know why the Bible's funny? Because life is funny. So Elijah, not at all sarcastic, I'm sure, says to them, well, maybe your God is on a journey. Maybe your God is busy. This is what the Hebrew says. Maybe your God is relieving himself. Maybe your God is having a slumber and you need to wake him up, so chant louder. I'm glad somebody's enjoying it. I love that smile. That's great. So the prophets of Baal, like they cut themselves and they're screaming more and everything, and of course nothing happens. And Elijah, just to rub it in, what does he do? What does he do with the wood? Does he tell God now, okay, God, send down the, the fire to light the wood? Reba knows what, what, what Elijah did. What did Elijah do? Put water on it. Pours the water on it. And then, and only then, do we see the true God. And the fire rains down, and the wood is lit, and, and then there's all this slaughter stuff, and you know, and um, Jezebel gets mad, gets mad at Ahab and says, you need to get Elijah killed, and of course Elijah the, has to flee, and he goes out into the desert, and it's like this wonderful scene from a Jewish mother, you know, the raven feeds Elijah, and God says, Elijah, you got to eat, and all this stuff, and then Elijah goes see the widow of Zarephath, and that's a wonderful story. But he's still being pursued, and so he goes to, to Mount Horeb, and he waits because he is looking for something. He is searching for something. He is searching for the presence of God. In a similar way in our gospel lesson, Peter is searching for the presence of God. If you all remember last week, we had the story of the feeding of the 5,000 men, not including women and children. Jesus had learned that John the Baptist, his cousin, had been beheaded, had been killed. Jesus wanted to spend time alone, but the people crowded and needed him. And he showed them compassion. And then he fed them. And then he went away again to pray. And, and the disciples went on a, a boat to the Sea of Galilee. Anybody been to, to, to Israel or been to that? So the Sea of Galilee was notorious. I haven't yet. Was notorious for storms to come up very quickly. They didn't have radar back then, folks. They didn't have AccuWeather. They didn't have any of that stuff. All you could do is do what? Look at the sky and check what the direction of the wind was, pretty much. In that time, and really hasn't changed that much, in, in Judaism and in, in those ancient cultures, the sea was dangerous. The sea was chaos. The sea was that place where you go and you may die. To the point, and in many of those cultures, before uh, people would leave for a trip on the sea, they'd basically almost have a funeral for the person. It's like, well, you know, you might die, so let's just have a funeral for you now. And then when they come back and they're okay, guess what you do? You celebrate, you have a party, right? So... The storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are upset and, and Jesus is walking on the water and, and they see him and he calls to him. He tells them what? Do not be afraid. Who else says do not be afraid a lot in the Bible? Angels, right? Anytime an angel shows up, what is it almost the first thing the angel says? Fear not. Do not be afraid. So what does Peter think going on? He's like, is that a ghost? Jesus said, it is me. It's, it's, it's who I am, right? Old Testament, Moses, burning bush, 
What does Moses want to know? God's name. And then we have Popeye the sailor man scripture. God says what? I am who I am. Tell them I am who I am sent me. Sent you. We have those, all those I am statements from Jesus. Um, Jesus says that I am the light of the, and the bread of, and the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what's the last one? Come on. There's seven of them. Come on. All right, I'll give you all a hint. This is your hint. The true vine. Thank you. Good job. See, sometimes these stoles come in handy for something. Do you all know what a stole represents? Have you all ever heard that? Have you ever been told that? It's a yoke, right? But there's another thing that it also represents. You know what it represents? It represents a towel. Because a towel was an instrument of service. Right? But yeah, the yoke, you feel it sometimes. Let me tell you. When the bishop puts it on you, and in this case it was, it was um, Bishop Cho, and he puts his hand down on your head, you feel it. So it is a yoke. It's also like a towel. But yep, came in handy today. Jesus is the true vine. Those I am statements. You know, Peter, we love him. One moment Peter is saying, you truly are the son of the living God. And the next moment, Peter's telling Jesus what to do. And Jesus has to say what? Get behind me, Satan. The same Peter that says, where else can I go? Where else can we go? Because you have the, the words of life. That Peter. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water and walk. Peter does. He does really well. The wind is blowing. The waves are going. Everything is going. Everything's fine until what? What happens? He takes his eyes off of Jesus. Happy birthday, Alan. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he starts to I was like, oh, that's a good sermon. Why don't you preach that sermon? Well, I'm not preaching that sermon. Good sermon, though. Just like those two pastors, Jesus does what? He grabs them out of the water and he gets them on the boat. And Jesus says, you of little faith. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? What do you think? You all have been going to church, some of you all, for a long time. They lose it. That's right. That's a great way to describe it. Jesus teaches the disciples over and over again, and it seems like they get it until they don't. Peter, you of little faith, you sank. But you know what Even probably even more than that was? Peter, you of little faith, I told you who I am and you still put me to the test and said, if it's you, Jesus, have me come out on the water and walk. Peter was searching for something. He was looking for something. He was struggling. The storm was raging. 
Elijah was searching for something. The storms were raging. They kept searching for him. They wanted to kill him. Y'all ever have storms? What do you do in the midst of a storm? You pray? You seek shelter? Is it better to be in a storm by yourself or with somebody else? To be with others, right? Amen to that? For a few years, we've all been in storms. We've been dealing with the storm of COVID. It was an equal opportunity storm. It impacted businesses and organizations and churches. You all weathered the storm because you did what? Kept your eyes on Jesus. Because you had Pastor Michelle. Because you had Chris. Because you had David. Because you had great lay leadership. Because y'all said, we're going to hold on. You have to remember that. Somebody asked me, and I didn't ask them if I could say this, so I won't say who it was. If they do hear these words and decide they want to, and I don't say fess up to them, but they came to me and they said, well, what are your plans? And I said, what are my plans? I said, I told you what my plans are. I'm going to listen. Right? I'm going to learn. We're going to live together. We're going to what? Hopefully laugh. And we're going to love one another. I've told SPRC in different ways. I think it was on that one Zoom call. I haven't had any other meetings at SPRC. Because it's been really difficult. And, you know, now Angie's recovering from surgery and, and everything. But I told him, I said, look, I don't come. There are no magic beans. Right? There is no master playbook. I come to love y'all and to love the community, to preach Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And then we go together Trusting in God. One of the other things that I, that I didn't mention that was uh, has been unique to the United Methodist Church has been the uncertainty within the denomination regarding disaffiliation and other things. And um, our church. Centenary, and I apologize if sometimes I use your and our because when it's in the past, I don't want to just, you know, take that away. That hasn't been an issue for our church. And that's a blessing because you know what? This has been hard enough. It's been hard on churches. It's been hard on pastors. It's been hard on district superintendents. Did you know that the Mountain View District has had probably 40% of all of the disaffiliations in the Virginia Conference? Can you imagine what that's been like for our district superintendent, Denise Bates? And there's still more to come. There's the last round in October. But you seek Jesus. You search out for Jesus. You recognize the importance of being together. 
Ida Powell shared a, a, a great story the, this morning in an email. I posted something about praying for Maui and the United Methodist Church and the United Methodist Committee on Relief. UMCOR is one of the premier relief organizations because you know why? If you donate money to UMCOR for something, you know what happens? 100% of whatever you donate goes toward relief. You know how they're able to do that? Because they fundraise for their overhead and their administration. You send them a check, you make a donation, you know it's going to go help people. So Ida shared that um, she and Bill were, were on Maui in the, the late 1990s and um, you went to Lahaina UMC and um, they were so gracious. She got to, they got to see the sanctuary and it had stained glass and, and the stained glass had, you know, scenes from the Bible except, you know, there were palm trees. Well, you know what? It's the Middle East. There probably were some palm trees. Like on Hawaii. Apparently they figured out who Ida was very quickly because you know what they offered her? A charge conference report. I'm sorry, friends. There's not a pastor in the world that wants to deal with a charge conference report once that charge conference is done. But they recognized that we had a Methodist geek in the best sense of the world, the word there, came back, they came back home. She goes to see Peggy Harper to proudly show her this. And Peggy, what did you say? Well, this is what I just said you said. You are one sick woman. <laughs> with, with great love and affection, I'm sure. We struggle with these things. So much music is about that struggle. It's whether it's you two. I still haven't found. Hello? Thank you. I had to get some Gen X back there to, to step up. All right. Well, then apparently I need to work on another generation. Otis Redding. Y'all know anybody know Otis Redding? What was his song? What was his number one hit? Sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time away. Y'all know the story of Otis Redding? That was his one and only number one hit. You know why it was? Because shortly after he finished recording it. It wasn't completely finished, but it was in pretty good shape. Calls his friend who produced the record before getting on a plane and says, I, I know we've got a number one hit. He gets on the plane and guess what happens? Plane crashes and he dies. Three months later, sitting on the dock of the bay, he died on December 10th, 1967, and March of 68, number one hit. We don't know how our lives are going to work out. We, we, we wish we did. Our lives in a lot of ways are like butterflies. Pastor Michelle, I, went, I remember from seeing the video, didn't she have a stole with butterflies on it? It was really pretty. Huh? Something. Cranes, maybe cranes or something. Thou shalt not covet. That was our thing in Sunday school. I'm not coveting it. It were cranes, not butterflies, but. Do y'all know why butterflies don't fly straight? It's not because they're drunk. Why don't they fly straight? It's aerodynamics, but there's another reason. There's an evolutionary reason. They got these big wings. 
They're really colorful, many of them. I always thought that butterflies and moths were, were dis- distinctive because of, you think of a moth as being kind of ugly and a butterfly pretty, but actually it's because one opens their wings and another, when it's resting and another one closes it and there's some other stuff. But anyway, butterflies don't fly straight because you know why? If they, if they flew straight, they would be easy prey for birds. Have you ever tried to catch a butterfly? That's why you have a big net. Because they go like this. Our lives are like that. It's not straight. It's not A to B to C. There are things that, that throw us for a curve. There are storms. There are changes. I saw Rob talking to Bill back there. And I know what Rob was telling them. Bill was getting ready to to come forward with the offering. Because that's the way you'd always been doing it. And Rob's like, that darn pastor, he changed the order of worship. And so he let Bill know. He's like, no, you just wait. We're just going to humor him. Some changes are are a lot bigger than that. But we remember those I am statements. Jesus, I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the the gate or the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true In the early church, they didn't call themselves Christians. You know what they called themselves? Followers or people of the way. That's who we are. We follow Jesus. Wherever that leads. That is our direction. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're searching for. And if we do that, We'll get where we're supposed to be. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord, that you are so gracious to be the one who shows us the way, that you indeed are the way. Forgive us, Lord, when we're distracted or too full of ourselves or or too busy or we think something can substitute for following you. We thank you, Lord, for the great blessing and privilege it is to be in relationship with one another, to be people of the way. We pray, Lord, for your healing and wholeness between nations, between political parties, within families, within churches. To put aside those things that divide and separate us. Help us, Lord, to share with joy what you have given to us so freely. Full and abundant life in you. We pray, Lord, for those who need your healing touch and those who journey with them. For Janice and Angie and others, for those waiting test results those dealing with difficult life decisions, for the homebound, for the incarcerated, for those who feel isolated or alone, for those, Lord, are seeking a way but don't know what the way is. We thank you, Lord, that we experience 
your presence in the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Not in the earthquake, not in the wind, not in the fire, but in the sheer silence. Quiet our hearts, Lord. Focus us, Lord, so that we might listen and drink deeply from the well of the Holy Spirit. In our lives, yes, Lord, each day and as a church together. Above all, we thank you and praise you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who in his teaching, in his healing, in his fellowship and friendship, in his suffering, death on a cross and resurrection, and his promise to come again, we have life. And so we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. pray together. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for your abiding presence and sustaining grace. Receive now these gifts we bring to you out of your generous provision in our lives. May they be used to bring healing and hope to a hurting world. Amen.
light of Christ will go out into the world as Taylor leads it out for us. But you all are also the light of Christ. Go in peace.